We, we began a brand new series last Sunday called More is More. And I know it's popular to say today less is more. And I agree with that as far as programs and sometimes material things. But I believe that, um, it, especially with spiritual things, more is more, right? All right, so think about this. Let's say you work hard all week and you're expecting a certain amount of money on your paycheck. And when you get your paycheck, it's short the money that you worked for. And you went into your employer and you said, hey, um, there's a little bit less on my check than I was expecting. And if they said to you, well, less is more, I mean, no, that wouldn't fly, right? Well, when it comes to the things of God, I believe with all of my heart that more is more. And so I, I said this last week that um, each week's title is going to be a question. And last week, I asked this question, what's your motto? And we looked at a Hebrew motto in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah was prophesying to Zephaniah, who God urged to rebuild the temple. And they had less men and less resources. And God spoke through Zechariah, and he said that it's not going to be by might, it's not going to be by power, but it's going to be by the Spirit. And an English translation of that would be, it's not by corporate effort, it's not by individual strength, it's by the capacity and the energy and the ability of the Spirit of God. And Zechariah had a vision of olive trees, and the, 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 the interpretation of that dream or that prophecy was there would be an ongoing, unceasing supply of oil. And so oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So that thing, it seems impossible or it's challenging or how can God do it? You need to expect an unending supply of the Holy Spirit. Now, we hear that. Everyone was fired up last week. Yes, by the Spirit. But, but it doesn't mean you just kick back and don't do anything and God just does everything. It means you cooperate with the Holy Spirit is what it means. There will be an unending supply of fresh oil, a fresh anointing, or a fresh touch of God to do that thing that seems impossible. So that was our title last week. Um, my title this week is, What's Your More? What is your more? Building off of what we talked about as far as the Holy Spirit goes, what's your more? I remember a few years ago, I was invited to oh, speak at this church event, and uh, it was a, de a denominational type of event, and so um, I, I pull up, and the people hosting me met me at the car, and they were all fired up. God's been doing this, and God's been doing that, and you're the man for tonight, and so I had to go take a little walk to make sure I had what God wanted, because there was a lot of expectancy going on. Now, because it was a denominational event, you know, I wanted to stay within the parameters of, of their beliefs. I, I believe it's unethical to do otherwise. And so um, I, I get up and, and I speak, and it went great. People were ministered to all over the place. God was moving. People were crying. And after it was over, probably for 45 minutes, individuals kept walking up to me saying the same thing. I know there's more. What's the more? There's got to be more. There's got to be more. There's got to be something else. And I kept having to say this to them. You just keep seeking God. He'll show you the more. Because of where I was, I couldn't tell them what I believed to be the more. Um, I, I have had uh, some friends from, from a church that I would run into places, and some of them even visit here, and they said, we miss the more. We want more. And it puts you in an uncomfortable place because I will never tell someone to leave a church and go to, you know, you need to come here. I will never do that. That's unethical. I don't do those things. But there, there, there is something in people, and I, I, will question, I will put the question out this way. Could you be saved and be born again and there still be more? There absolutely can be. And what the more is, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I ended with this scripture last week, and I want to start back there. Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter, but Jude chapter 1, verse 20. It says this, but you, beloved... So he's talking to us, right? Anytime you see beloved or beloved, <laughs> he's talking to believers. So you, beloved, build yourself up. Be founded on your most holy faith and make progress. That means more. Rise like an edifice. Well, I, 
you know, I haven't used that word in a sentence lately, but edifice, if you look at the word, it means to be edified or edification. So the Bible says this, build yourself up on your faith, rise like an edifice, be edified higher and higher by praying in the Holy Spirit. Those two things, faith and the Holy Spirit, have to go together, and the Holy Spirit should always build on faith. Uh, you, you see a lot of times people can get off on some things in the Holy Spirit because it's not founded on faith. So faith and the Holy Spirit always work together. I like what Joseph Prince said. He said, if all you have is just the word, you're going to dry up. And if all you have is the Holy Spirit, you're going to blow up. But if you have the word and faith or the word and the Holy Spirit, you're going to grow up. But I do believe that the more in this series, the more that those illustrations I just shared with you, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say up front in here that we are a spirit-filled, faith-filled, grace-filled church. And I believe 100 million percent in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what I want to do today, and especially in the next week, I want to bring you so much clarity that you will not leave here unless you're full of God's Holy Spirit. So in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 12, it says this. It says, the doctrine of baptisms, it's plural. So that means there are more than one type of baptism, and there's actually three different doctrines of baptism. And the first doctrine of baptism is what you might hear is the, the baptism or the doctrine of the baptism of blood or salvation. And what that means is when you got saved, born again, that's a baptism. You were saved, born again. You became a Christ follower. You were given eternal life by believing in your heart and confessing that Jesus is Lord. That's the first baptism. It's the baptism of salvation. And you say, well, why do I have to be born again? Because you were born in the flesh once. It didn't work. So you had to be born again in the spirit. Your spirit, man, was born again. That's the first doctrine of, of baptism. The second doctrine of baptisms is water baptism. That is a public expression or declaration of what Jesus did on the inside of you. You are publicly being dunked in water and, and, and being, as Jesus died and rose again, it's a symbol that you have new life and the old life is being cut off of you. Matter of fact, last Sunday night, let's roll those slides behind me here while I'm talking, we baptized about 13 people um, after our service. And yes, uh, we had a tent over, but it was... It was lightning and thundering, and they're like, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to baptize them. That's what we're going to do. Because you don't ask me those questions, right? Because I'm not very safety prone. So um, <laughs> we baptized whole families. These are people that um, a lot of people, you know, if you were here, you might have been inside because of the rain. But we baptized whole families, baptizing people who said, hey, I want to make a public declaration that Jesus is my Lord. That is the second doctrine or second part, second type of baptism. So we have the doctrine of baptisms, which is to be uh, saved, the baptism of salvation, and we have the baptism, or the doctrine, the baptism in water. I love this one. He's like, yes. <laughs> so it was an awesome night. But there's a third baptism the Bible talks about, and it's baptism by fire or baptism in the Holy Spirit. So there are three doctrines of baptism. And if there are three doctrines of baptism in the Bible, we should want all three. I'll show you this more next week. When the Bible talks about those baptisms, it, uh, the language is not suggestive language. It actually is uh, imperative. It's written in the imperative tense, which means it's a command by God. Now, if you, if you always wonder why I say Greek, if you don't know this, the New Testament was written in Greek, so we translate the Greek to English. So that's why a lot of times if I say what the Greek really means, that's the original unction or intensity or verbiage of, of, of what the Greek says. So there are these three baptisms. And usually, salvation, water baptism, we get, we don't say much. But there seems to be controversy, and there seems to be confusion oftentimes, because usually, here's why, over, the, over baptism in the Holy Spirit, and here's usually why, we have one side over here that says it uh, was for then and not now. And then sometimes you have the group over here that, that usually gets... Um, sometimes into extremism with it, and um, it seems extreme because they're not mixing it with faith. It often gets mixed with emotion. And so what I want to do this morning is just bring truth to you, because I believe truth brings freedom. 
And so I believe when you leave here, everyone in here will be like, I want to make sure I'm full of the Holy Spirit. So let's go in the New Testament to the book of Luke. The book of Luke is actually Luke, chat, Luke the second part of the book of Luke. And it's talking about the emergence of the church. And you'll see these three baptisms here. So y'all glad you came? Yeah. Acts chapter 8, verse number 5. So Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them. What do you preach to unbelievers? You preach Christ. You preach John 3.16. God so loved this world, he gave his only son so that no one would perish, but all who believe would have what? Everlasting. So to an unbeliever, we preach Christ. We preach the gospel. So Philip went down and he preached Christ. That's what he was preaching. He was preaching the gospel of grace. He was preaching the love of Jesus. And the multitudes... With one accord, they heeded the things spoken by Philip. They heard and they saw the miracles that he did. So he preached Christ. They heeded it or they bought in or they believed. They became Christians, born again. They became Christ followers. They received Christ as their Savior. That's an example of the doctrine of salvation or the baptism of salvation. When you are born again, Christ comes and he dwells in you. Y'all got that, right? Verse 12 and 13. I'm gonna, not going to read every verse for time, but verse 12 and 13, same chapter. But when they believed Philip, when he preached these things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, both men and women were what? They were baptized. So they were saved and they were baptized in water. So we see the the doctrine of baptism is happening here. Water and salvation. Now move down to verse, uh, next verse, verse 14. Now when the apostles who were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent out Peter and John to them, who when they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the what? The Holy Spirit. For as yet he had, not, he had fallen upon none of them, and they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. So they laid the hand, their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. We see all three of the baptisms working in this passage of Scripture. Salvation, water baptism, and now the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And at salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. Now we're looking that the Bible says the Holy Spirit gifted them with power or fell on them. Now, Luke chapter 11 says this, we preach the Holy Spirit to believers. So if you're preaching to unbelievers, you preach what? Christ. If you're preaching to believers, you need to preach what? The Holy Spirit to them. This is, this is what the Bible is saying. All three of those doctrines are here. Now, the Bible says this, prove things by two or three witnesses, right? So let's look at another passage of Scripture a little bit further in the book of Acts. And it happened. Everyone say happened. While Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, he came into Ephesus, and he found some disciples there, and he said to them, so he finds some believers there, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Listen to their answer. We have not so much even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what were you baptized? They said, well, we were baptized into John's baptism. And Paul said, John did baptize with repentance, saying to people, you should believe on him who would come after him, which is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. We see those three baptisms again. And we see the initial evidence that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit was guess what? The evidence they spoke in other tongues. There are five different instances where in the New Testament it talks about believers being filled with the Holy Spirit. Three of those five times it says they spoke in other tongues. The other two times it's inferred that they did. So the evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit is guess what? You speak in other tongues. Now, I mentioned this. But the devil likes to put fences of controversy around the truths of God. For example, there's a lot of controversy when you start preaching that God wants to prosper you. But God does want to prosper you. Scripture proves it. How many believe God's a healer? 
Well, there's controversy around. The devil erects these fences of controversy around truths that should have no controversy. And when you start talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, guess what there is? There are these fences of controversy, and they should never be there. Uh, denominations or teachings have done, and if it's been taught that tongues aren't, let's just think about some of these myths. First of all, a lot of people will say, well, tongues is of the devil. That's ridiculous, and here's why. That means ridiculous on another level. Because why would the devil do something that gives you power? Some people say it was for then, it's not for now. Listen, we, we can't just pick and choose things that are in the Bible. We've got to take all the Bible in and say, what did God say? And he said, be saved, be baptized in water, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so there shouldn't be these controversies. But the evidence originally was they spoke in other tongues. The Greek word for other tongues is this word glossolalia, which sort of sounds like you're speaking in tongues anyway when you say that word. Now think about that word, glossolalia. What, what does that sound like? Glossary. That's where glossary comes from. And really what it means is a language that's unlearned or you did not learn that language. Now, in college, and I've been on several outreach trips into Latin countries, I love the Latin culture. You would think, by all my trips, I would know some Spanish. I know Spanglish, which means just enough Spanish to get myself in trouble, which has happened more than once. But see, you can go learn Spanish or French or whatever, but you don't learn tongues. The Bible says it's a heavenly language and it's evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit now Jesus toward the end of his ministry and I mean you got to think Jesus is on tour with his team and let me tell you a few things Jesus did on tour he laid his hands on blind people and guess what they saw he laid his hands on lame people guess what they walked he laid his hand on lepers and guess what they were made whole he laid his hands on dead people. And guess what? They started breathing again. And the disciples are like, this is great. We're going to take the world by storm. And out of nowhere, Jesus said, listen, I'm leaving. And they're like, no, 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 no. We got a good thing going on here. And Jesus said, it's better that I go. Why, why would Jesus say that? Because Jesus said, this is what he said, it's better that I go. But he said, Take heart because I'm going to send you, the Greek says, an exact replica of myself. Now, why would Jesus say it was better that he went? Well, see, Jesus had been with them, but now Jesus was about to be in them. And the only way that he could be in them was what? By his spirit. And they weren't getting it at, at, at first. But he said, I'm going to send you the comforter, which means an exact duplicate just like me. But see, Jesus could only be with them one place at one time, but now he was going to be able to be everywhere by his spirit. And he said, here's what I want you to do. This is the last thing Jesus said before he was, you know, beamed up. He, he said this. He said, I want you to go. Listen, he was talking to a group of about 500 plus people. And he said, I want you to go into Jerusalem during the festival, wait in the upper room, wait for the promise. And when the promise comes on you, there's going to be a boldness that comes into your life that's going to give you witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. He said, I'm going to power you up. Because to be filled with the Spirit means to be infused with power, to be infused with might, to be infused with efficiency and strength. Now, the Bible gives us this word. It's called dunamis power. Everybody say dunamis. Now, that word may not mean a lot, but it is our English word dynamite. For some of us, dynamite. Y'all remember that? Who remembers that? Dynamite. There we go. To be filled with dynamite. It's the same word as dynamite. So God says, wait, there's going to be a power that comes on you. It's going to be like dynamite. Isn't that a cool way to look at it? It's going to be like dynamite. And he said, wait. But we get to the book of Acts in chapter 2. And we find out those 500 people were now only about 120 people waiting. Where, where was the other 380? I mean, they had been with Jesus. They saw stuff. They were following. But now there are only 120. But 120 of them are waiting. And the Bible said all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit entered the earth in a different dynamic. And it filled them. And the Bible said all of them 
spoke in other tongues. Especially a man named Peter. Because the last time we saw Peter, remember he was off in the distance and they accused him of being a follower of Jesus. He's like, I don't even know this guy. He wimped out. But Jesus met him on the shore, made him some fish sticks, remember that story? And spoke grace to him. Now he's back in favor with God. And Peter gets filled with the Holy Spirit. This guy who denied Jesus, who was a wimp, all of a sudden, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. He preaches the first sermon. Thousands come to Jesus. The church starts. And we see throughout the epistles, the work of the Holy Spirit in spirit-filled believers. That's how God wanted it to be. He never wanted it to be, well, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They, he wants us all to be saved, water baptized, and filled with the Holy Spirit. That's his church. Now think about Peter, though, because... Um, when, when Jesus met Peter, his name was Cephas. And Jesus said, we got to change your name. Here's why. Because Cephas means leafy, flaky. Aren't you glad Jesus changes things about us? He said, Cephas, we're going to change your name, right? To what? Peter means piece of rock. See, God wants to change some things in your life. And all of a sudden we see Peter... Who becomes what? One of the greatest preachers, doing all these great, and, and the church starts. But it didn't start until after he was filled with the power of God. Matter of fact, I want you to think about, and I'm just saying, Jesus was actually water baptized. So God had one son, right? And if God, I mean God, this is God's boy, if he needed water baptized, don't you think you need water baptized? <laughs> And, and oh, by the way, the Holy Spirit fell on Jesus. And if God's only kid needed to be f full of the Spirit of God, I think you do too. <laughs> and I think I do too. Right? Matter of fact, you could look at it this way. Salvation gives you hope, but the Holy Spirit gives you help. And God knew I need to send my power to be in my people. So what I want to wrap up with here is three guarantees of praying in the Holy Spirit. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, these are three guarantees. This is what happens when you pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, next week, I'm going to build on this and talk about what, what measure do you have. But what's your more? In your life, what, what, what's your more? See, I, I grew up in a denomination, and I just want to give you a picture of what those folks were like. Of course, I was younger, so they all seemed like they were 100. But other than that, they really loved God, and they were on their way to heaven. But there was, like, not hardly any victory in their lives. And week after week, I mean, the services were, they were boring. Not much happened. They were just trying to be good people, but they loved Jesus. And then I had this uncle who was in ministry who... He had some churches, but then he traveled. But I would go spend some time with him, and, and this is what I saw. I saw people getting saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. I saw people getting healed. I saw people getting delivered. I saw power in people's lives. He actually laid his hands on two different people, and they started breathing again. They were dead. There was a difference. And although one was much more comfortable, the other was much more attractive. And I'm like, if we're going to walk out this Jesus journey we should not only want, but we need the power of God residing in us. Three guarantees. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you, you can read the whole chapter on your own. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not taking anything out of context, but just because of time, I'm going to read to you four verses, starting at verse 2. And it says this, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but he actually speaks to who? God. For no one understands him, However, in the spirit, he actually speaks out what? Mysteries. Verse 4. And he who speaks in a tongue actually edifies who? Himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, then my spirit prays, but my understanding is actually unfruitful. So what's the conclusion? So this is what Paul's saying. I pray with my under, or I pray in English with my understanding, and that's my mind praying. And I pray in the 
in, in the Holy Spirit is my spirit praying. See, we're, we are made up of flesh, spirit, and soul. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. You have a spirit. That's what's born again. So we can pray with our mind, but we can also pray with our spirit. So Paul says, what am I going to do? When I pray in the spirit, I feel built up. I'm praying to God. Not only am I praying to God and feel built up, I actually pray out some mysteries. He said, so what do I do? Look what he says. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray with the spirit. I'm going to also pray with my understanding. And then he goes, I'm actually going to sing with the spirit, and I'm going to sing with the understanding. So here's what he's, what he's saying. I'm going to pray in English, and I'm going to pray in the Holy Spirit. See, there are sometimes people have come to me and said, I need you to pray about something, or I got this going on. Great, hey, God, do this, blah, 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 pray for him. And then there's sometimes, I, 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 don't know what, I don't know how to pray for him. Or even in my own life, sometimes I don't know certain things. I got to pray in the Holy Spirit. So Paul said, we need to do both. Now, he goes on, we're not going to talk about that today. He goes on, but he talks about how you don't do that at certain times in front of certain people. But here's the three things I guarantee you happens in your life when you start praying in the Holy Spirit. Number one, God is always magnified. Paul just said, when I pray in the Spirit, I'm not praying to somebody else. I'm actually praying to God. And when I'm praying to God, he gets magnified. Acts chapter 10 verse 46 says this, they heard them praying in tongues and God was magnified. Now the word magnify means this, you make something larger and bigger. Now you can't make God bigger, right? You can't make God larger. Here's what it means to us. You ready for this? I love this. It actually makes a big God look like he really is to us. That was weak. I said it makes a big God look like he really is. We don't make him bigger. It just makes us aware how big he is. See, we, we get really used to talking about the problems. You know what? Sometimes I'm out places. You know how, um, now nobody in here, they were actually in the first experience. But think about this. You know how there's just some people just, it's all a problem. They just, oh, Pastor. Pray for me, Pastor. Just, and I'm not against praying for somebody, but you see them coming, you hear them coming. It's just one thing. It's just problem, problem, magnified, emphasis on the problem. So I do what every good pastor does. I go down the other aisle. I don't even go near them. <laughs> I know it's not what you want to hear, but that's what I do. It's how spiritual I am. Like, I don't, I don't want to hear this. But we get so used to how big our problem is and how destructive everything is that, that when we begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, it actually makes a big God look how he is. And he gets magnified and our faith gets stirred and our courage gets stirred. All of a sudden we see the promise giver instead of the problem. All of a sudden we see the miracle maker instead of the mess. All of a sudden, we know that if God's for us, doesn't matter what's coming, God's magnified. And sometimes we, leave, we lose perspective and we lose perception that God is really a big God and God can do big. But we talk so much about the negative. Matter of fact, if you pray in the Holy Spirit, I want you to get, you cannot be negative and positive at the same time that you can't have both of those things being comfortable in you when you're praying in the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, you can't have fear and faith comfortable in you if you're used to praying in the Holy Spirit. But see, we, man, we like to moan, and, and I'm not saying it's not serious, and I'm not saying it's not challenging, but we've got to understand we can do something about that. Sometimes we, we just want God just fix it. But sometimes God wants to magnify himself in your situation. Sometimes he wants to fix you. Because you're harder to fix than the situation. Sometimes you're the mountain. Sometimes you got to get out your way, right? <laughs> it's like putting our focus back on God. Because the Bible says we don't, when we speak in tongues, we're not speaking to man. We're actually speaking to God. You have a direct line of communication to God. And I love this. One of the most important things that gets stirred is your praise. Instead of your, when God gets magnified, when he gets magnified, there is only one response. God, you're worthy. God, I praise you. God, I make you big in my own eyes. God, you're awesome. God, you're, you're, you're faithful. God, you're good. God, you're holy. God, you're mighty. God, you can do. Our praise is what gets ignited when we pray in the Holy Spirit. 
I just often wondered, I'm going to start doing this. And I'm not talking about if you come to me, because I don't want you to walk out and think, we can't ever go to him. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying about the person that comes to me all the time with the, you know, they're not in here. They come to the 930, but, but, <laughs> but they, you see them come, and you're like, oh, it comes Debbie Downer, wah, 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 here they come, right? And you're just like, I just want to look at them and say, you know what, if you just go pray in the Holy Spirit, it'd turn this around. It'd turn your perspective around. It'd turn your faith around. So the first guarantee I make you, you start praying in the Holy Spirit and God gets magnified. He gets magnified, the problem gets minimized. Here's the second thing. And the second thing is this. It says this, that he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Now now look at, who's it edify? Okay, here's the answer. Y'all didn't get it. Himself, you, gets edified. Wow, that sounds a little arrogant. No, he said, would you pray in the Holy Spirit? He gets magnified, and you get edified. God wants you edified. You don't get extra points in heaven for going around like this. Oh, you see your servant. No, he don't want to see that. He wants to see a servant full of power of God, have some faith in him, stirred up, being edified. Now, remember when I told you that the New Testament was written in Greek? So we see that word edified, which means what? Built up, right? Erected, built up. Here's what it actually means in the Greek. Can you all handle this? It means when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you're edified on the inside. Here's what it means. A megastructure is being built on the inside. Well, thank you for your enthusiasm. A megastructure is being built. Listen, so everything may not, everything on the outside may not be coming together at the right time like you want it to, but on the inside, a megastructure is being built. Someone, something might be coming against you from the outside, but you're praying the Holy Spirit. It's building a mega structure on the inside. It, it may be a little old elderly lady who looks like she got no strength, but she might have more power than all of you because on the inside she's been praying in the Holy Spirit, and there's a mega structure stirred up on the inside. See, what God wants to do is make you bigger on the outside than what's on the outside coming against you. Because God's on the inside, He's building a mega structure, building you up. Remember being built up in your most holy faith. Being built up. Here's a better way of saying it. Being charged up. Being charged up. You ever just feel like, man, I just need charged up. See, see, here's what can happen. Well, I'll just call the church. They'll charge me up. But what happens, see, here's what's been going on. For a few weeks, um, if you were trying to watch the live stream last weekend, it, obviously it didn't work because our internet was down. And they kept saying, well, something in your building. Well, we found out last week it wasn't something in our building. Don't get me started. But it was actually something outside our building here and here. And so if you called the church, our internet was down, which meant our phones were down. So you couldn't have got a hold of us. Now, we would have gladly responded to you, but you, what if you couldn't get a hold of us? No internet. I don't know how Jesus did it without Facebook or the internet or Wi-Fi, but he did some way. But we didn't have either one. So, you, so what if at that moment, I can't get to church, what am I going to do? Well, you still got a hotline. You got a direct line. If, you, if you're feeling, hey, listen, there are times. I know I look like super pastor up here, but I live life just like you do. And some days I don't feel so courageous. And some days I don't feel so bold. And some days I don't, I don't feel so stirred, but I have to make a decision to begin to pray in the Holy Spirit because you know what it does? It stirs my faith. It stirs my courage. It stirs my boldness. It stirs my strength. It turns my can I into I can. And it's not a super pastor power. It's actually available to all believers. And so we build ourselves up. Our boldness gets stirred. Our confidence gets stirred. So God is magnified. I am edified, and here's the third guarantee. Everything else is clarified. Now now listen to what I just said to you. Think about your life. Think about your opportunities. Think about your obstacles, and know this. What if I said to you, God left you a promise that if you were filled with the Holy Spirit, then you would pray in other tongues, and when you pray in other tongues, the first thing that happens is God gets magnified. Everything else is minimized, which needs to happen in our life for God to do the things he's promised to do. And what if I said to you, not only is God magnified, but you're edified from the inside. You are built up like a megastructure. So that takes care of God, that takes care of you. And everything else is clarified. Here's why I say that. Check this out. Everything else is clarified. Because you are praying 
in the spirit, the devil cannot understand because you're talking directly to God. If you go and you pray, Father, I'm just praying that you, 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 you turn this situation and you bless um, Billy Bob and, and, and you, 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 God, you just open this door. The devil can hear that. He can hear those prayers. Because one, he works in the thought realm. Two, he, he can hear. But when you pray in the Holy Spirit, he has no idea what you're praying. He has no idea what you're saying in the Holy Spirit. He has no idea. I think that's pretty cool. Because I don't want the devil knowing what I'm praying about. So one, the devil can't understand it. You're also praying, the Bible says, mysteries. Look at somebody and go, mysteries. I know that's a creepy word. Really what it means, here's what it really means. It, it, just it, The unknown or limitations. So think about this. When you pray in the Holy Spirit... The devil doesn't understand, and you're praying out some mysteries, some unknown things that the devil doesn't know, and you're praying directly to God, and you're praying exactly in line with the will of God. That's, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, every time you're praying exactly, I call them the prayers of heaven, because it's directly the will of God. So what are some unknown things? Well, maybe you're here, and and you're a high schooler. You're about to graduate. I don't know where to go to school. I, I don't know what I'm going to do in life. You start praying in the Holy Spirit now, you're praying out a mystery now. When you graduate, you'll know. Because the Holy Spirit reveals the things of God. How about this? Where do I live? What career path? Things in your life. Pray in the Holy Spirit. You're praying. Out. How, I don't know. How, about, how about this? Maybe this will help some people. How about this? Maybe you're single. And you're like, God, I, gotta, I, I want that person in my life. And you're just walking around and you're like, eh, she's pretty good. He's pretty good. She's fine. <laughs> he worships Satan, but he's fine. I mean, that's not, right? So I don't know who. <laughs> At least he acts like it. <laughs> I don't know who. I don't know when. How are you going to bring someone into my life? You know, I've been to every church service. I haven't found them there yet. I went to the, you know, farmers only. I did the single man. I'm doing all this stuff. Man, but what, what, what if you started praying in the Holy Spirit? Because it's unknown who I'm supposed to be with. God can walk somebody from the other part of the world into your path. I remember hearing this story years ago. Um, there, there, there was, uh, it was at a Bible school, and this group of students uh, were in Bible college, and a few of these students just like every other student, they just, you know, wanted to go have fun, good time, nothing wrong, just good time. And so they're just having the time of their life and doing whatever. And there was this one student who couldn't always go hang out with him, go to movies and all that, because he needed to make some extra money to pay his school bills. So he worked at the college at night as a janitor. So he just made up his mind. Every night, I'm scrubbing toilets, I'm, you know, wiping the floors, whatever, all the, taking out the garbage. He just began to pray in the Holy Spirit the whole time he did it. See, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, it's like laying out tracks to your future. So it came time to graduate. That whole group of students, all of a sudden, they didn't know where they were going to go work, what they were going to do, what was next. This guy walked right out of Bible college, got a job, part of a church, is a great pastor now. It's not because he was special. He just was praying in the Holy Spirit, and it laid tracks for his future. So you do not have to live your life. I hear this all the time from believers. Well, you just never know what's going to happen. Well, yeah, you do. I'm not saying there's no, never any unexpected things, but the Holy Spirit wants to tell you things that are coming. But he's got to let you pray out some things. Listen to this, listen to this, and I'm not saying this because it's me. I just feel urged to say it. Um, I got a call from uh, an educator, and they said, hey, before school starts, would you bring your team and just come down and pray over our school? Absolutely. We get there. We start walking around the campus of their school. We're praying. I just start praying in the Holy Spirit. God tells me, you need to pray to stop a school shooting. We just pray in the Holy Spirit. We get back. I said, man, we, we need to pray to stop a school shooting. It wasn't but a couple months ago, the authorities caught someone with a plan to shoot someone at that school. 
Now, I'm not saying I'm the guy who stopped it, but God wanted it stopped. So God spoke to us while we were praying in the Holy Spirit. We just prayed it out, and guess what? The authorities got them. They turned them in before something happened. And that's not, oh, you're, there's those super pastor powers again. That's not what it's about. It's just about God's looking to talk. God wants to talk. Think about that. I was in Dallas. I get a text. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you guys remember? Two months ago, we walked around the school. We prayed in the We could have kept that school from a tragedy. God wants to keep some tragedies out of your life. And God also wants to get some things happening on the earth. And he does it by invitation, his people inviting him and his people praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. How many think that's a pretty powerful thing? I was humbled. I wasn't like, look at me go. No, I was humbled. I was like, God, how many other times did I not pray and you couldn't speak to me? You had to speak to somebody else. Because God is a God who wants to change situations and people and things. That's why he said, I gave you those two things. We, we, we read them in the book of Jude. Faith and the Holy Spirit. The word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's all stand. Am I glad you came today? And really my challenge is this. I, I'm gonna talk more about this next week, but I think you need to get up in the morning and spend a few moments praying in the Holy Spirit. I think you need to, at midday, do the same thing, and I think you need to do it in the evening. And if you've got to get up and lock yourself in a room or get in your car, before you walk in the doors of your business, before you walk in the doors of your school, you got to just be, not, I'm not telling you to walk in the front doors like blah, blah, blah. No, you, you need to get yourself stirred up, prayed up, pray out what God might want you to pray. Now listen to this. Gonna, I just want you to hear this. The Holy Spirit does not pray for us. He helps us pray. Y'all got that? Now listen to this. The Holy Spirit does not take control. He helps us pray. I've heard the Holy Spirit just took over. No, he didn't take over. He helps you pray. He's the helper. You say, well, how do I receive this Holy Spirit? Well, remember Jesus made a command. He said, I want you to be saved. I want you to be baptized in water. And I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, your life takes a quantum leap. Because the power of heaven now gets in you. Wow, how do I get that? Well, here's how you get it. The same way you get anything else from God, by faith. By faith, you respond to what I'm preaching this morning. The Holy Spirit is received by faith. And the Holy Spirit is spoken by faith. And the Holy Spirit becomes more fluent in our lives. It's like the more, um, okay, so I've spent some time, a couple times in the Dominican Republic. And Spanish in the DR is more like slang. So you're there a few days, and you can actually start understanding. Start speaking. So the more fluent you are, the better you get at it. What if we became proficient in the Holy Spirit? See, I, God declared this is our year of freedom. We've had so many good things happen in the area of freedom this year. And I, in a couple weeks, I'm going to tell you what he told me in April to tell you about your next year. But before we get to that, I believe the freedom thing, the Holy Spirit thing is setting you up for your, your best season, your best year yet. So my question would be, then what's your more? There really is more of God. That night I was at that service. I left there. It was a great service. I left there like, God, they just, they want more. But there is more, and it is the Holy Spirit. There's more than just being saved. There's more than just being a public witness about it. There is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and it's a life changer. Actually, it's a game changer. Paul said this. I'll talk about this next week. He said, I pray in tongues more than all of you. That's a bold statement. Paul's conclusion was, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a per per person of prayer. I'm going to pray in the natural, and I'm going to pray in the supernatural. The Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, is the supernatural. It changes everything in your life. It makes you bolder, stronger, more efficient, more capacity. That's why Jesus said, I command you be filled. So this morning, we sang the song, stir that fire up in me. You know what that's about? It's about the Holy Spirit. God, stir that thing up in me. And I believe this this morning before I let you go, because I can't preach a sermon and just let you leave. I believe if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to get filled. We're going to do this song. You're going to be filled. You can be filled right where you're at. Maybe you've been filled. 
Actually, the way the Greek words it, and I'm going to talk about this next week. You got to come back next week. It says, be being filled. It's not a one-time deal. Well, I was filled in 1986. You need to be filled in 2018. I believe this morning. I believe that this was my prayer. This was my goal for this morning. Everyone that was in our services is filled with the Holy Spirit, and they have the evidence of speaking in other tongues. You say, well, do you? I speak in tongues all the time. I know some of you think I'm weird, but most of you, I'm not that weird, right? There is nowhere in this Bible that says this. I have yet to find it. If thou was filled with the Holy Spirit, thou gets flaky and weirder. I used to think that because the people I watched talk about it seemed that way. But there's nowhere in the Bible. It doesn't say it makes you weirder. It says it makes you wiser, makes you more powerful, makes you more efficient, makes you stronger, makes you know the heart of God, pray out the plans of God. Man, like, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know what to do with my kids. Pray in the Holy Spirit over them. Watch God change. I don't know what to do this next. Pray in the Holy Spirit. You're able to pray out something the devil doesn't know. But only God knows. Tired of being beaten down. It's time to get stirred up, edified on the inside. Make God bigger. How do we do that? God, stir a fire up. Let's put our hands to heaven. Father, I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, as we sing this song, as we praise you. God, you fall on this place. You do an Acts chapter 2. Here today, you fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray we speak with other tongues.